Andy, it's, it's great to be having this conversation it with is. you about Islam. Now, this is something that you've spent a lot of time talking about, and it really started your interest, as I understand it, 20 years ago. That's so right. can you tell us how, as a Christian, you got involved with engaging with Islam and with Muslims? Yeah, I would love to. So for, uh, for me, that began in the late 1990s. So in the late 1990s, I was, a, I was a youth worker working for a group of churches in London, and I hadn't thought about Islam, hadn't thought about apologetics or any of that kind of stuff. And then one day, uh, a gentleman came to our church to do a seminar on Islam and understanding, and understanding Muslims and reaching Muslims. And I just sort of went along to it, sounded interesting. Well, he was one of the most kind of charismatic, engaging speakers I've ever heard. So I went up to him afterwards and we got chatting. And one of the things he'd done in the seminar was describe some work he was doing at a place in London called Speaker's Corner. And Speaker's Corner is the corner of one of our big parks in London. Hyde Park. Uh, Hyde Park, yeah, you know. And so on a Sunday afternoon, you can stand on a ladder or a soapbox, or if you're short like me, several boxes, and uh, you can speak about anything, religion, politics, sport, you get a crowd. Now, he'd figured lots of Muslims were going there, so he was basically going to reach the Muslims who were coming there to preach Islam. So we got chatting, and he said, well, why don't you come to Speaker's Corner and see what we do? So two weeks later, I schlepped up at you know, Marble Arch Underground Station at Hyde Park to be met by Jay, and uh, he had not one but two ladders with him. And he said, I brought a spare ladder. I thought you'd like to <laughs> preach with me. Um, I said, I've never preached on the street before. I've never talked to a Muslim before. He went, oh, it's easy, it's easy. Well, there were about 200 Muslims there that day, and uh, there I was on my ladder, and they ate me alive. Uh, they fired objections and questions and heckled. I'd never seen anything like it. It was a barrage. And I remember getting down from the ladder thinking, I guess I need to become a Muslim because they have all of the questions and I have absolutely nothing. And so I remember going home, lying awake in bed that night, actually tossing and turning. My long-suffering wife poked me in the ribs about three in the morning and said, you know, why are you tossing and turning, keeping us both awake? And I said, well, I um, told her my story and her advice was, well, why don't you read a book or something, I ideally in the morning? Yeah. So the following morning, I went, to the, <laughs> I went to the local bookstore, bought my first book on Christian apologetics. I think it was C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. Mm. Read and read and read. Went back to Speaker's Corner the following week with answers to every question they'd asked me. And they had new questions, and they made me look stupid all over again. And this, we repeated this little exercise for about three months. You're a glutton for punishment. Glutton for punishment. <laughs> I'm, I'm British, you know, it just yeah. goes with the territory. And, but uh, it's a great way to, to learn about Boy, you right? learn, I tell you. Um, and so, but what that did is interesting what God did. God gave me a love of evangelism through that, a love of apologetics, and a love of engaging Muslims. I mean, I didn't, I, I didn't hate these guys. I just wanted to answer them. It was frustrating, but I, there was a passion. I love their passion. I think that's what drew me, and the, their energy was attractive. I love spending time around, around Muslims for that reason. And so through that process, just really fell in love with engaging Muslims. And in fact, what that did is that opened the door to more and more and more study that eventually led to, led to theological college, and that eventually led to actually getting a PhD in Quranic studies, because I wanted to answer the arguments, but also I wanted to understand my Muslim friends as well, and uh, as the deeper the conversations went. So yeah, so actually my, my doctoral work was in Islam, not in Christianity. It's interesting, <clears throat> you make a point right at the end of that, you know, trying to, not only trying to be able to answer the questions, because I think, but also understanding. So one of the things that, um, some of the things that we've, we've dialogued and, and talked about, and things and people that, you know, people that all over the spectrum that I've, I've had conversation with. One in particular that I, I found very um, enlightening too, which is this idea of like, yeah, if you're going to understand somebody else's perspective, you know, it's getting it from their perspective or getting it, you know, like you could, you could sit and have, like you said, read a book about, say, Islam or any, any worldview, but from a person who doesn't hold that. Or you can go to the source and say maybe, you know, read their literature, read different things of a different worldview. Um, but to take that even a step further and dialoguing um, with that person. I think already you're saying that that is important, but for a person who's sitting going like, yeah, I, you know, I can think of students, you know, we look at the idea of like, you know, being you know, in the east in the Toronto area or even in Edmonton here in Canada or, and all over the world, we're seeing this idea of, you know, globalization, people, you know, there, there's multi, you know, cultural, multi-ethnic, multi-generational, it's being much more, there, there isn't this, you know, compartmentalization of cultures anymore. So just as an average person who might be in a workplace or might be in school um, that are even friends and they're like curious, like, um, you know, I'm, I'm a Christian or I'm a Buddhist or I'm a, you know, Muslim. Um, and I have a, a friendship or I'm interacting or I'm in a workplace or I'm in school with somebody else who holds a different worldview, you know, if they're going like, I, yeah, I'd love to be able to start engaging that conversation. You know, what's your advice, mm. even just for the average person, you know, how, how, do you, how do you start engaging in that conversation with somebody who might seem quite 
opposing, like you said, you got up on that ladder and all these questions came. Like, there's that fear, or like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to answer all those questions. Like, what what do you give advice for a person that's looking at wanting to start into those conversations? Yeah, Drake, that's a that's a good question. And I think I think actually, what I like about this kind of approach. Um, I always want to say to people, that kind of speaker's corner, high pressure cooker uh-huh. environment, most people are not going to run into. So I'm always very careful when I tell them that, that story because I, I wouldn't want people thinking, well, gosh, you know, obviously, you know, Andy, you're a thinker. Are you were able mm-hmm. to engage. I, I couldn't. So go, well, okay, don't go and stand on the ladder at speaker's corner. <laughs> Maybe not the thing. You may still meet an, a Muslim friend who's very ardent in what mm-hmm. they believe, but it won't be the same as having 20 people yelling at you simultaneously. Um, but here's the interesting thing, in terms of engaging people in, a, in evangelism and sharing Christ with them, I think what holds many Christians back is we, is we don't talk to non-Christians. Mm. Um, and the best form of evangelism I know is talking to people. So I think just breaking down those barriers is a great start. And one way of doing that, I think, is if you have somebody in your life or in your, you know, in your, in your circle of connection who doesn't share your worldview, be it, you know, it could be an atheist or a Buddhist or a Hindu or a Muslim, um, Great opportunity there, right there. And if you don't know anything about their worldview, actually that makes it super easy. Because if you have a Muslim friend at work, why not take your colleague out for lunch and mm-hmm. say, you know, forgive me for asking, but you know, you, I understand you're a Muslim, I'm a Christian, I don't really know anything about Islam. What do you believe? Mm-hmm. Don't go in initially going, right, I want to beat this person down. Use it as a learning opportunity. Mm. Um, and whether they're at the more sort of, uh, you know, sort of stringent end or then the more sort of dialogical end of Islam, either works. You use your Muslim friend as your textbook to start mm. with, because the great thing is you're learning it from the, from the horse's mouth. Because one of the dangers of just doing it book-based, I mean, I've, I, I've run into this over the years, and I still have to remind myself of this. You know, I started by reading Christian books about Islam, then I progressed to you know, reading books written by Muslims, which is important. And even there, the danger is every individual you meet is going to be slightly different. And the lesson I had to learn early on and I still occasionally fall into this trap and catch myself doing it, is a Muslim will say to me, you know, well, I believe X, mm. and I know that the Quran doesn't teach X, and the temptation is to go, well, actually, no, you don't. No, no, let me tell you what Islam is. Yeah. And I now find myself instructing a Muslim in their own faith, <laughs> which is a crazy position and arrogant. Um, so it's every person you meet is likely to be slightly different. Mm. Um, same goes for Christians. Yep. So I think, uh, yeah, you know, a little, little, little bit of reading helps, but talking to people is, is profound. Mm. And, um, you know, one of my buddies likes to say, you know, one of the simplest forms of evangelism for Christians is keep asking the other person questions until finally they ask you one. Mm. And, and they will, because people love the opportunity to talk about themselves. And if you've asked them lots of questions, you're affirming them, you're respecting them. Yep. They're probably at some point going to do the human thing. Say, well, okay, yeah, well, thank you for listening. Hey, what do you believe? And now you've earned the right, yep. and you're not going to come across as a sort of, you know, Christian trying to beat them into submission. Mm-hmm. You're having a conversation. Conversation's great. That's why God made coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was to wake up in the morning, but yeah. hey. That too. Now, now the, the Western discussion about Islam since 9-11 has linked it quite closely with terrorism, at least in the minds of yeah. many people in yes. the West, and certainly the last couple of years, the insurgency of ISIS or ISIL in northern Iraq and Syria has only heightened that link. And so we have recently in the United States, uh, people like Ted Cruz, Donald Trump running for president, making some pretty strong statements against Muslims generally. Yep. Donald Trump infamously late in 2015 calling for cessation of new Muslim immigrants to the country, for example. We can have our concerns about that and about broad brushing entire groups, but I think we also need to address this issue. Yeah. And so I want to hear from your perspective, what do you see as being the link, if any, between Islam as a religion and the kind of radicalization and <coughs> violence that we find in a group like ISIL? That's, an, that's an, a hugely important question, Randall. Before I answer it, actually, let me say, let me say something first, actually. I think, I think whether whether you're dealing with, with Muslims in your community who are moderate or radical or anywhere in between, the Christian response was still called to the same. We're still called to love our enemies, even if Muslims were our enemies, most aren't. But even if they were, mm-hmm. I said to Christians, we are still called to engage them with the gospel. And I think that step is sometimes missed. I sometimes sort of run across Christians who get drawn into this, all Muslims are to be feared, and therefore, I don't know, we throw them out, we do a Donald Trump on them. That's not the gospel. Even if they are to be feared, Jesus tells us to love our enemies, we also neglect the fact there's at least two, possibly three terrorists mentioned in the New Testament. The uh, Paul, when he was Saul, was killing and murdering Christians. He was a terrorist. He was an extremist. What happens? He becomes, you know, writer of the largest chunk of the New Testament when he encounters Christ. 
within the circle of Jesus' disciples. We have Simon the Zealot. Mm. The Zealots were effectively a Jewish terrorist group in the first century. Um, or a freedom fighter. Or freedom fighter. Depending on how one defines one terms. But anyway, they, you know, we know the kind of <laughs> yeah. worldview they espoused. Sure. And Jesus had Simon there in his group. And of mm-hmm. course, uh, Judas uh, Iscariot, although his story didn't turn out quite so well, mm-hmm. you know, potentially the name Iscariot comes from Sakari, mm-hmm. you know, the dagger men who went around murdering high-profile Jewish collaborators. And Jesus welcomed these, these, these guys into, the, into, his, into his group. So as Christians, the first thing to remember, whoever we are dealing with. And uh, I have a good friend of mine who runs the only Anglican church in, in Baghdad, in Iraq, uh, a guy called mm-hmm. Andrew White, known as the Vicar of Baghdad, actually. I encourage listeners to Google Vicar of Baghdad. Andrew's mm-hmm. story is amazing. He's done incredible uh, work in terms of peacemaking and uh, in, in the Middle East, known as an incredible... Uh, person who listens to people from all sides. And I love Andrew once said, he said, I will sit down, have dinner with anybody, Al-Qaeda, moderates, whatever, because I'm trying to build bridges. He said, the only people I won't do it with is ISIS. He said, I did actually reach out to some of their leadership mm. through a third party and, and, and asked if they would, uh, they would have dinner with me. And they, they wrote back and said, if you come to dinner, we will kill you. And he said, maybe I won't do that then. Yeah. Um, but I think as Christians, hey, that's a good model. Now, the theological question, which you mm. asked uh, a few minutes ago, I wanted to put that, that missional context in. There are two mistakes, I think, that people can fall into around ISIS uh, and extremist Islam. Uh, the, what, the first mistake is to label every Muslim as terrorists or extremists, everybody. So that lovely Pakistani next-door neighbor of mine, you know, I suspect that he's building a nuclear bomb in his, in his garden shed. I need to be afraid of him. Every Muslim is a terrorist and extremist. Wrong, 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 wrong. The majority of Muslims are moderates. The majority of Muslims here in North America uh, and the West have emigrated here because they want to build families and have security and raise children, have jobs and home, all the things that we want to. Mm-hmm. Um, that's why they're here. We forget that many of them have come here to escape the nonsense mm-hmm. in the Middle East, not to export it. So I have absolutely no time for the Donald Trump end. It is it is lunacy, and it's for those anyone who calls themselves Christian, it's not an option. And it plays into the hands of ISIS too. It does as well, yeah. exactly. Absolutely it does. But there's another mistake as well. And the other mistake is to swing the other way and to say there is absolutely no connection mm. between ISIS and Islam, which leads to the bizarre position that it, it, it leads to us to ignore what ISIS and Al-Qaeda say about themselves, um, because whenever they make pronouncements, it's always steeped in quotations and sh- rulings from you know, Sharia law, the Hadith, the Quran, the life of Muhammad, and so forth. They consider themselves to be an Islamic group. And I think if you're going to even just understand your enemy, mm-hmm. you need to understand your enemy's ideology, even though they may not approve of it. And uh, the fact of the matter is, is there is a tradition within Islam. It's not the only tradition, but it is one of the traditions within and mainstream Islam that has seen violence as appropriate. And... Um, one of the most helpful uh, journal- one of the articles in the mainstream media on this was uh, is an article called What ISIS Really Want, written by a journalist called Graham Wood. People can Google it. I think it was in the Atlantic uh, magazine from, from memory. And it's not easy. It's a 20-page article. He begins by apologizing for the length, but he needs to go into detail. Mm-hmm. These days you have to apologize for anything <laughs> over 500 words. Gosh, hey. <laughs> and basically what Graham does is a beautiful job there of setting out ISIS's theological roots. And that's the conclusion he comes to. He says they are a prophetic ideology because they believe it's rooted in a tradition going back to Muhammad. It's not the only stream within Islam, but it is one of the mainstreams, unless we recognize that and deal with that. There are also Muslims making the same point. So uh, one of my acquaintances is is a wonderful Muslim human rights activist based in Toronto. Her name is Rahil Raza. And again, you can Google her work. And uh, she did produce a sort of 15, 20 minute documentary last year called Islam by the Numbers. And it really tries to address this question of what percentage of Muslims are, are radical, what percentage are, are moderate. And it raises some great questions. But she starts by saying, I'm a, I'm a Sunni Orthodox Muslim. I love my faith. But nevertheless, we have a problem in mm. Islam that we have to address. So I think those are the two traps we need to avoid. And I think the challenge is for, for Christians, people of all faiths and none, including you know, moderate Muslims of good faith, of which there are millions and millions and millions, have got to get together around the table and address this head on. But we don't do it by ignoring the ideology, nor do we do it by demonizing everybody. And that's not an easy conversation. I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, I think, I think the thing that I, what I think I appreciate what you're hitting on this, too, is that in a lot of these conversations, and we've we've kind of tackled this <clears throat> in writing and in some of these videos too in Bull Cup is just this idea of like the false dichotomy, right? So it's like, it's easy to go in any conversation on any topic to go, well, you see these two extremes and it's easy to want to do the all or nothing, right? To say, 
Muslim is, you know, the, the Islam faith, the Muslim faith is all about terrorism because I see this, or you go to the other, you know, um, social perspective and say, because of these people, because of Donald Trump, because of the people that are voicing these things, you want to go to the other extreme because that guy sounds like a jerk, and so I want to defend my Muslim friends. And so then I go to the other side of the, of the argument and just say, well, that's not fair. No, there, there's no danger. Why, why are you criticizing, you know, and to have this, like you said, to have this hard conversation. I, it, <clears throat> it really makes me want to want to push the question a little bit further. I'm going to put you a bit on the hot seat. Go for it. And, and maybe, maybe I mean, I'm not sure how you want to answer this question, but a lot of the conversations that I'm seeing online, too, as for Christians, is this balance between what you have said as a Christian to be about love and about compassion and about service and loving our enemies, while at the same time also being a citizen mm. of whatever country, be it United States, be it the UK, be it Canada, going, I mean, we have, let's just, let's, let's really bring it down to even the things with the refugee conversation of like, there's these fears of, you know, um, the, the strategy of ISIL or ISIS, you know, bringing in insurgents through the refugee, you know, um, you know, aid. And so as a citizen and a Christian, there's this conversation that I've been seeing online, be it, you know, social media or blogs of how do we, how do we both be compassionate while also being, you know, um, safe or, or, hmm. or wise and, and not just, you know, putting people at danger. And I think that that's a, that's a question a lot of people are trying to wrestle with of this whole refugee conversation. So if yeah. somebody would ask you that question, how would you, how would you go about answering it, I guess? Do you know, it's a great question. In fact, I had, you know, I was, I was recording a radio program earlier in the week and uh, the radio host, uh, who is American radio station, I mean, put basically, you know, the very same question to me, but a bit more sort of sort of uh, teeth in the, in the question. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, well, why should you know, we allow all these refugees in? But if, if, they, if, they, if, they, if, they, if they've all got Kalashnikovs under the bed, I mean, this is a wise idea. Yeah. So we had to, I had to deal with that a little bit and go, trust me, they don't all have <laughs> Kalashnikovs uh, under the bed. But, yeah. you know, but the point is still there. I'm gonna be really honest with you, uh, Drake and Kat. I wish I knew the answer. Yeah. I think I think the most the most helpful conversations I think on some of these deepest issues come where we map out the pieces we have to play with, put them all on the table, and then try and roll up our sleeves and, and wade in. Mm -hmm. Because I think what you've done is you've mapped out the tensions to yeah. go, we wanna be a we want to be open and hospitable hospitable. As Christians we're, we're called to be that. As you know, as Canadians, yeah. this is a country that was built on, on immigration. We want to we want to welcome mm -hmm. people. Okay, so that goes on the table. That's part of who we are. We can't let that go. On the other hand, we also have the issue that you know ISIS, ISIL, Daesh, however we label these guys, yeah. um, do have a strategy. We've seen what's happened in in Europe. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at look at Brussels. Look at look at look at Paris. So the question has to become, you know, how do we put the checks and balances in? Now I can slightly cop out, I guess, and go because I'm not a politician. Yeah. And actually, it's one of the things. In all seriousness, I say this to Christians. Sometimes I get Christians say, "What should our response be to ISIS?" And I do sometimes say, "Well, if you're involved in the, if you're not involved in the politics, in politics or the military, yeah. the answer is nothing. You can't do anything. Um, realistically, you can think these issues through, but you're mm -hmm. not a policymaker. We perhaps other than pray for and encourage our leaders." I think we have to be honest about the conversation. We also need to understand the ideology. I think one of the things that's gone wrong in politics in the West is because politicians are afraid of touching some of these hot seat issues, the conversation hasn't been had, mm -hmm. which means we're not equipped. On the other hand, I think the other thing that policymakers have fallen into the trap of is just not understanding theology. I think too many Western politicians have bought into the idea, what I like to call the kind of Marxist view of religion, that it's all about economics. Yep. Um, you know, and so if we could perhaps just solve the issues on the ground, if we can create more, I think was it Hillary Clinton some, was famously sort of said, we just, the solution to ISIS is more jobs in the Middle East. That's the solution. And I sort of vaguely understand where that's coming yeah. from. I'm not picking on, on her. That, that's, a, that's a liberal politician who doesn't understand theology, just sort of scrabbling for an answer. I don't think that's enough. So I think it's how do we start talking about the importance of theology, um, both good and bad. Yeah. I think God has been pushed out of the public square. Mm. And I can partly understand why people are afraid of that conversation. We've got to bring it back in again, because there's good religion and there's bad religion. Mm -hmm. um, how do we assess the difference? What are the right kind of questions that we should be asking as we assess people coming in as refugees? Yeah. How, do we, how do we diagnose some of these? What do we look for? What are the signs that radicalization is perhaps going on in and around a mosque? That's not an easy conversation. We need to get our moderate fr Muslim friends involved in that conversation and start building the mechanisms. There's a lot of work to be done, but I think it begins by putting all the pieces on the table. Yep. Uh, and we can go, okay, now this is what we're working with. I sometimes feel at the moment half the pieces have been swept off the table and under the carpet. Well, and that's what I'm wondering, like you said it too about, like it's, 
do you think that it's fair to say that a lot of this conversation, I mean, most conversation, but this conversation in particular, that when you think about the comment you made about Hillary Clinton, that we're trying to give these simple answers, you know, to a very complex conversation? Do you think that's a fair? I think so. I think, I think partly, I'm a great believer, actually, in that you get the politics you deserve. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to blame the mass media mm -hmm. for, the, you know, the, uh, the juvenile the juvenilization of politics, but then let's be honest, who consumes the mass media is us. Mm. If all of us voted with our feet and, you know, turned off, you know, Fox News and CNN and CBC and just boycotted the mass media, they'd change what they sell us because yeah. they're just out to sell the product. But we do live in that age and so politicians operate in a world where they know the thing they say is going to be tweeted and mm. around the world and so, you know, everyone's thinking in terms of what fits into 140 characters, for yeah. example. And that's reduced politics, I think, to... Uh, you know, to a game of just posturing and soundbiting. I think that's half, that's half the problem. There's a bigger question lurking here, isn't there? How do we create a space in the public square where we can really talk about deep issues uh, that are complex mm -hmm. and, not, and politicians not be afraid of saying, well, I guess if I say this as I'm thinking out loud, it's going to be instantly tweeted. Yeah. And for Christians, I say this is why we need to pray for our leaders, because I would not want to be a politician in the current climate. It's really, really mm. tough really, really tough. I have sympathy for those on all sides. I even have sympathy for the Trumps yep. of the world because what's made him the person he is, he's playing to a crowd. Um, Clinton's playing to her I crowd. I thought it was a spray tan, but... Do you not think orange is a good look? Uh, it works for him. <laughs> that, I'd like to, to, to turn to this phrase that we often encounter in these discussions, and that's the clash of civilizations. Samuel Huntington, yeah. The West and the East, or the West and the Middle East. And I think in... That can certainly be overplayed, but I'd like to just highlight one important difference that I think probably is there, and I'd like to get your feedback on this. Throughout most of the history of the Christian church, there was no sense in the Christian church of religious freedom. And that began to change, it really changed in the 17th century, after in particular the Thirty Years' War, uh, 1618 to 1648, there was this growing sense in Europe of the fact that you should not or try to compel belief in other people, that people should have their own right to believe religiously as they so choose. And then you would know in England after mm. uh, the glorious revolution, 1689, 1690, that really changed. So that, yeah, you could be a Baptist, you could be a nonconformist to the Anglican church and you're not gonna go to prison. Mm. Right? And this is, or, or face any censure. And this was, this was a big change. Now we just sort of assume that hmm. you don't compel belief in other people, that people shouldn't be punished for having the wrong doctrines, at least by the state. Is it the same in, in the Muslim world, or is there a different understanding of religious freedom vis-a-vis -vis the state and punishment and compulsion? That's a great, that's a great question. It actually ties into the, the, the earlier one, just in this degree, that sometimes if I'm feeling mischievous and you know, the questions about you know, kind of refugees comes up, I sometimes like to point out to, to North Americans that you know, most, many of us here our ancestors came here as refugees, mm. often to escape religious persecution. I mean, look at how America was, was founded with mm -hmm. uh, people coming you know, to escape quite what was going on in, in the UK. So we should at least be open and sympathetic. In Islam, it is a different case. A number of things are going on uh, in Islam. Historically, Islam has always considered uh, religion and politics to be part of the same conversation. You know, we have this idea built into the West of the separation of church and state, as you rightly point out. It wasn't always there, but we've, we've built that very carefully. Um, and I think it's something that's, that's precious. And I think one of the dangers is that we've now grown up in a, in a, in a culture that's had this for so, for so long that we just assume it's natural. You know, well, who wouldn't want to think in terms of religious freedom? The answer is this is, we're, we're a blip in history in terms of free speech and freedom of religion. And I think it needs protecting. It's something, it's something special. Now, because Islam threw those two things together, uh, if you read the Quran, the Quran talks both about religious things and, uh, and more sort of societal politics ideas, often jumbled up into the same, into the same context. And then very shortly after, after the Islamic civilization began to be built in the, in the centuries following Muhammad, Islamic jurisprudence begins to develop and be built up. And the four schools of Sharia law are developed and are, and are codified. And built into Sharia law, are a number of uh, prescriptions on religious freedom that I think cause problems. Uh, all four schools of Sharia law uh, are pretty clear when it comes to apostasy, uh, the freedom to change one's religion. It's not, it's not there uh, historically in Islam. And blasphemy is the other one. Now, when you look around the world today, those are two hugely hot 
topics. Um, there's been a lot of work done in the West on religious freedom issues in the past few years, particularly the, the Pew Forum in the, U, in the US have been instrumental, a lot of the research there, the UN now tracking uh, religious persecution statistics. And it's interesting, which who, who's ever numbers you look at, um, when you look at the top sort of 10, top 20 countries for religious freedom issues in the world today, with the exception of China and North Korea, it's always Muslim countries that top the, the hot list for, for persecution or the persecution indexes. And I think it's Sharia law is the problem. I always want to actually try and separate out when I talk about this perhaps on universities and say, the problem isn't Islam per se, the problem is you know, Sharia. To mm. par in the paraphrase the sound of music, how do you solve a problem like Sharia? I had to get a cheap joke, Ooh. I know, I know. Bazinga, as you would say. And, um, and yeah, and so what's interesting, when you look at surveys that have been done, I think you and I were at that, uh, a, a dialogue event last night, Randall, and I brought the figures up there. You know, if you look at the numbers, uh, when Muslims are surveyed in, in Muslim majority countries and ask questions like, what do you think should be the punishment for apostasy or for blasphemy, those numbers track pretty high. I think in Egypt, it's north of 80% of Muslims surveyed think that you shouldn't be allowed to change your religion. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that, that, that f similar kind of numbers as you sweep across the, the Middle East. And uh, so one of the problems is that uh, um, the, the Pew Forum's uh, study on religious persecution a few years ago concluded that the unifying factor in where religious freedom is under threat is once the state begins interfering in religion, which is where you started in your question, that's where the problems begin. And the problem is that Sharia gives a, a Muslim government a built-in method to interfere uh, mm -hmm. in, relig in, in religious freedom. And so this is the huge issue uh, in Islam. Uh, and to be fair, this doesn't just apply to, you know, to Christians and other religious minorities, it can apply to Muslim minorities. Sure. Uh, so I have many friends who are Ahmadiyya Muslims, and Ahmadiyya, the Ahmadiyya are a sect of Islam considered heretics by, by many Sunni Muslims. They have been horrifically persecuted in countries like Pakistan. Um, I meet there's a lot of them driving taxis in Toronto, and it's mm. always interesting. I remember a few years ago, a, a Muslim driving me from the airport, and we got talking, and I said, where are you from? He said, Pakistan. And, he, and I said, oh, so what brought you to Toronto? He went, well, you know, we're not considered good Muslims back home, so my family had to flee here. And I said, were you, are you members of the Ahmadiyya community? It's incredible, his whole face lit mm. up in a big, he said, you've heard of us? And of course I've heard of you. I, you know, your world center is in the UK, about 20 miles from where I used to live. He went, yes, yes, it is. It was a lovely conversation. Mm -hmm. So I think this is an issue, I want to frame this, it's not just an issue affecting Christians, because yeah. sometimes this is framed as, oh, this is you Christians, you know, uh, sort of lobbying for your co-religionists in the Middle East, and yes, we are. Um, but this actually affects all people. Mm. And so there has to be a conversation uh, around, around Sharia. And one of the things that frustrates me, I think, is when you, there's been great work done by organization, organizations like the UN, the US government have got a pretty good office of religious freedom now, but they're sort of still skirting around this issue. Nobody wants to talk about the elephants in the room. I think that was a phrase you used Brett, yesterday, Randall. Well, one of those elephants in the room is the Sharia elephant. Mm. And there has to be a conversation about that one because it affects the lives of literally hundreds of millions of people around the world every day. Mm. So when you think about like this whole conversation, um, especially, I mean, the majority of the people I think watching or listening to this is going to be um, of some type of Western perspective. Um, I'm just trying to think too, like, can you touch, I don't, know, I don't, I don't want to give a number on it, but some of the, the biggest misconceptions that people want to go to that they perpetuate of this idea of this understanding of the Middle East or their understanding of the Islam faith that just, like maybe you're, maybe even to the point of putting in this language, you're sick and tired of having to kind of like unravel or explain because we keep going back to these misconceptions. So if somebody listening or watching this are just like, what are, what are like the, you know, some of the biggest misconceptions that we need to stop perpetuating when it comes to the Islamic faith? Yeah, good question. So I think we've touched on some of them. I think yeah. the idea that all Muslims are extremists mm -hmm. or violent, we've touched on that, but we need to press into that one because I think even even people who wouldn't subscribe to that directly, there's the subliminal fear. I think mm. a lot of people have a fear of Muslims. We've got to address that and, 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 and move on. Um, yes, there are the problems in the Middle East we've just talked about. Yeah. Yes, there's the problems with ISIS. The majority, the vast majority of Muslims here in the West have come here because they want to escape that kind of nonsense. They have no desire to export it. Mm. Okay, there may be a tiny minority of extremists, but it is a tiny minority. Most of us, the Muslims we meet at work, in our neighborhoods, on our campuses, are going to be moderate Muslims. You know, Randall and I were involved in a dialogue event last night, and the imam from one of the local mosques here was there. He was a wonderful, wonderful gentleman. Mm -hmm. I mean, really lovely man, who I'd, I'd be proud to call a friend and a neighbor if I lived here. Um, most Muslims we meet are like that, so we need to break that one. 
Secondly, I think um, the other misconception, and this is interesting because it's almost pendulum swinging the other way, is the idea that Muslims are just, you know, Islam is really just like Christianity, mm. but with, what, with beards and burqas. Um, which is funny, on the one hand we're afraid of Muslims, on the other hand there's a tendency to collapse everybody together. Yeah. Phrases like Abrahamic faiths are thrown around, that Muslims and Christians are lumped together. This happens a lot in, this, where they, we tend to see this more is in our secular culture, that tends to talk about people of faith and, and this kind of thing. So Christians can buy into that, one place we buy into it is I think if we feel a bit besieged in our faith with a great kind of secular society out there, there's a tendency sometimes to huddle together with others who believe and that kind of, you know, sort of the people of faith can camp out in this island over here, pull up the drawbridge and mm -hmm. the secular world out there. And I want to say to people, I think we need to get our heads around just how different Islam is as a religion to Christianity. When I first started studying, uh, engaging with Muslims and even studying Islam mm -hmm. in the 1990s and 2000s, I think I went into it thinking there'd be huge amounts of similarity um, because, you know, Islam talks about some of the same things that we do as Christians, God, religion, mm -hmm. prophets, scripture, and so forth. But underneath those surface similarities is a huge difference. The reason why it's good to affirm that is if we think that our Muslim friends are going to believe broadly the same as we do with one or two minor differences, there's really no motivation to get to understand them. Mm. Um, if somebody thinks differently, to you, you have to start listening. You know, if you believe the same as I do on everything, Drake, there's no conversation yeah. to be had because you're the same as, as me and I can ignore, ignore you. Um, if on the other hand that you're different, then I've got to go, oh, this is curious. Mm. I've never met someone quite like Drake before. I need, to, I need to ask you a few questions. And that's a good opportunity to, to discuss. Which is funny because I think people often think it's the way around. People think, well, if we think people are different, how do we build civic society? Well, civic society, liberal democracy is built and we go, hey, we're different, but we need to understand those differences. And Christians, I think, often get trapped into thinking because our Muslim friends use the same word that we do, they mean the same thing. Mm -hmm. And largely, it doesn't. Quranic theology is a very different animal to, to biblical theology. I have a wonderful opportunity to wade in and ask questions and go, so to explain to me what you believe. What do you believe about God? What do you believe about Jesus? What do you believe about sin? Mm -hmm. You know, last night we had some, some great conversation there in the dialogue event that we were involved in. Randall just threw theological questions at us and, you know, my Muslim friend and I kind of answered and there were, there, was, there was some broad similarities but also huge differences. So appreciate the differences, get away from this fearing Muslims business and then reach out and make friends with our Muslim neighbours. If there are Muslims in your street, you know, go and knock on their door, invite them over for coffee. If you're on campus or at work and there are Muslim students, Muslim colleagues, go sit with them. If you're a Muslim on campus listening to this, if you're a university student and there are Muslims on your campus, go to their university groups. Don't just go to the Christian campus group. Go to the, go to the Muslim campus group. Sit at the back. Trust me, they'll come to you and ask who you are. Great opportunity to make friends. Mm -hmm. One more thing I'd, I'd like to come to. It's a feel bad about raising it because in a sense it's a big topic but I also think it gets a, it gets into the theology and into what mm. might be some of these differences and it was one that's really dominated the conversation yeah. in the last few months <clears throat> so there was a, a professor at Wheaton College in yes. December of 2015 and she was expressing solidarity with with Muslims and some of the, the fear and anger toward the Muslim community in the United States and one thing she said in I believe it's a Facebook post was that uh, quoting, I guess, from St. Francis, uh, uh, from Pope Francis, not a saint yet, uh, from, quoting from Pope Francis that Muslims and Christians worship the same God. And this phrase has, it, it led to a parting of ways, ultimately, between Professor Larissa Hawkins and Wheaton College, but it also has spawned all sorts of discussion and debate in the Christian and evangelical community in particular. Do Christians and Muslims worship the same God? So I'd like to throw that question out to you, get you to sort of parse it apart a bit and then give your response. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a great question and, and you're right, it's amazing the way it's kind of set the conversation ablaze. I was in Chicago um, about four weeks ago and uh, was due to be doing an open forum on, uh, on atheism and actually the organizer said, could we change it and we do the Muslims and Christians worship the same God and I think we had sort of six, seven hundred people wow. out that night, huge interest. I won't comment on the Wheaton piece because I think sure. in someone else's internal politics is, yeah. is not polite, so we leave them to, to deal with that one. But the question, do Muslims and Christians worship the same God? You know, it's, it's a perfect example of a bad question. That's one of the problems. By which I mean, sometimes there are questions that are really clearly formed. Sometimes there are questions that throw together so many different pieces you have to kind of untangle it. It's a bit like mm. five kittens and a ball of string. And I think that question confuses a number of things. It confuses the question of, well, who is God in, in Islam with, well, who is it that Muslims are worshipping? 
That may sound sort of obvious, but um, let, me, um, let me try and pass it as you described it. Let's separate it into two questions for a moment. Does the Quran describe the same God as the God of the Bible? Here I think the answer is clear. I'm going to be direct. No, I don't think it does. When you, when you look at the, the, the way the Quran talks about God, the attributes that the Quran uses to describe God, they are time and time again so different from the biblical ones. They also, often many, in many cases, directly subvert the biblical ones. For example, I think one, one very strong theme in biblical theology is that as well as being transcendent, being high and, and, and lofty and majestic, the God of the Bible is also imminent. He's, he's present with his people. And we talked about this in the dialogue event last night. And, and, uh, and what is interesting, well, I remember one of the questions that you put to Imam Sheriff, the Muslim, uh, a dialogue partner, you asked him, Randall, whether, you, whether he believed as a Muslim that God was, was relational. And if you remember, he, he didn't like that term. He, he basically said no. I mean, he sort of fleshed it out a little bit, but basically effectively said, said no, the God of Islam is not a God that you can have a personal relationship with that one might know. The God of the Bible, that's very clearly a biblical theme from the beginning of the Bible to the end. Um, the God of the Bible is a God who is, who is love. The Bible says that in numerous Place. In fact, directly says it in the first epistle of John. And of course, that the, God, the God of the Bible is a God who is loving is what drives uh, the incarnation, as Paul puts it in the book of Romans. You know, for God demonstrates his love in, in this while we are still sinners, Christ died. The Quran really doesn't like the term love around, around, around God. It's very corrupt. The Quran is very nervous to use that term. And in fact, many Muslim theologians I've read caution Muslims against describing God as a God of love. You shouldn't use that term because to love something means you lack something is the idea and Allah can't lack anything so God can't be loving. And we could, if we had time we could go through theme after theme after theme that the Bible is very comfortable with talking around, around, around God and the Quran either avoids that theme uh, or subverts it. So I think the, the God described by, is by the Quran in Quran theology very different. Now what about individual Muslims? Well, here things get more complicated because I meet many Muslims when you talk to them who do believe in a God who's relational, who would say that they can relate to Allah and their prayers, who would say that God is loving. Now, I confess early on when I was dealing with Muslims, my response when I encountered that, when a Muslim said they believed in a God who was a God of love, I, I look back now with horror because I would often go, no, you don't. No, 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 that's not the God of the Quran. You're wrong. And then proceed to try and you know, deconstruct them using Quranic theology crazy thing to do and I, if I, could, if I you know, could go back in time and tell my younger self some wisdom from my older self, that's not helpful. Now when I meet a Muslim who says they believe in a God of love, what I want to do is go, absolutely, that's phenomenal, I completely agree with you, I think God is a God of love and I want to pull them into that conversation and then when I find time and have earned the, the, the opportunity to do so in the, in, the, in the friendship, what I want to say to them is, you know, the God you are describing to me sounds more and more and more like the God revealed in the Bible than the God revealed in the, in the Quran. Why don't you come on home? And basically, the approach I'm taking there comes right out of the New Testament. Look at Paul in Acts 17 in Athens. If you remember the story. You know, there's Paul walking around the city. He sees all the different idols, all the different temples. They, 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 he's greatly concerned, uh, Luke tells us. But then he comes to the, you know, the altar to the unknown God. Now, given what we just read and given the fact that, you know, Paul... You know, as a good first century Jew with, you know, everything in him trained to sort of, you know, stand firmly against idolatry, one would have expected Paul to go, you ridiculous Athenians. This is... But he doesn't, does he? He uses this as a bridge building point to the gospel. Mm. Oh, you have this altar to the unknown mm. God. Hey, what you guys worship as unknown, let me describe to you. And I think in our engagement with many Muslims, that's a great model to go to yeah. listen to what they believe and where we can find those contact points pull them towards the God who's revealed himself, his, himself in Jesus. One of, the, one of my favorite biblical stories since uh, working with Muslims is consistently uh, Luke 15. And the story of the, well, we often know it as the story of the prodigal son. It's unhelpful because Jesus tells us that you know, there was once a man who had two sons. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in Arabic mm -hmm. versions of the Bible, um, the earliest Arabic translations of the New Testament, that story is known as the story of the compassionate father. And what I like, what I find fascinating about that story is the, the prodigal son we all know about. You know, he's the guy who goes and wastes all of his money on wild living and that kind of stuff. I think he represents in many ways the kind of typical Westerner who wants nothing to do with God. He's run away, you know, God, I want nothing to do with that. I want to live a life of free, unfettered consumerism. I think that's a great model there for dealing with Westerners. But the older son, who we often miss, very interesting because he's the legalistic, uptight, moralistic one. You know, look at his conversation with his father. All of these years I obeyed you, I kept the commandments and you know, tried to relate to you that way. 
And Jesus is making the point there. He's addressing Pharisees, who are the legalistic, moralistic ones, but to go, you know, you can be as separated from God and as far from God through moralism and legalism as you can through hedonism and wild living. And every time I read that story, I think that younger, that older son is responding like a, like a Muslim because the Pharisees were in many ways similar to, to Muslims in terms of they, the way they view the law and the way that they view that you please God. And there's a wonderful book by a New Testament scholar called Ken Bailey, what, who I think has some of the richest understanding of the parables that I know. Ken lived and worked in the Middle East for 40, 50 years, and so has really thought through you know, how the teachings of Jesus work in a Middle Eastern context. And he wrote a book called The Cross and the Prodigal, in which he basically does exactly that. He says this, this parable is wonderful evangelistic material for engaging with Muslims, people who think that it's all about the law, that it's all about legalism, it's all about moralism. And the love of the Father that's shown there, the uh, love that God has expressed in Christ, is what we want to draw people to. And so when I hear the whole question, who do Muslims and Christians worship? The Quran and the Bible describe two very different understandings of God. But I think because God has placed a desire for a relationship into the human heart, as Augustine famously said, you know, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. We should find ways to bridge build to our Muslim friends, find those points of connection and draw them in to the God who's revealed in Jesus Christ. Seems a good note on which to end. Thanks for joining us. Well, thank you, Randall. Thank you, Trey. Yes, it's been a great you. conversation. Yes, for sure.